This video is a ministry of the First Baptist Church, Pampa, Texas. We are located at 203 Northwest Street in downtown Pampa. Join us for worship this Sunday or visit us on our website at firstpampa.org. Now enjoy the rest of the broadcast. Great song this morning. Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1 and Luke chapter 2 will be there in... In just a few moments. Does anybody here, do you like to control your schedule? Raise your hand if you're a control person. You like to know what's coming. Yeah, the honest people raise their hands. The rest of you, you know you do too. You don't like it when things are spinning out of control and things you can't, you can't see coming. How many of you feel like this Christmas season for you has just spun out of control? You, the, 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 the programs, the parties, the the gift purchasing that you haven't done yet and places that you have to go and your, uh, your plans with your family gatherings and travel and some of those things are just, they're just out of control and you wish it would just kind of calm down. Well, if you think your Christmas is out of control, the first Christmas was way out of control. I mean, it was way, way out of control. I don't, I'm not real bright, but I do know this, that doctors suggest to women expecting children, especially women in their third trimester, but especially in their last month before delivery, they, they expect and encourage them, and I don't know that they can order them, I don't really know how that deal works, but they shouldn't be traveling, right? I mean, they should stay placed close to home, should should keep it, uh, take it pretty easy. I'm not talking bed rest, but they shouldn't be on a donkey or walking for 60 or 70 miles. I'm just thinking that's probably a little out of control. Well, if you think that part of it's out of control, then all of a sudden you're not just going to this peaceful, quiet place. You're going to a place where it's so crowded you can't even find a hot wire room. I mean, it is crowded. You can't find a place to stay. There's nobody that will take you in uh, except for one guy who says, oh, there's a barn out back. You can hang out there for a little while. If that's the case, then your Christmas is out of control. Would you agree with that? So that first Christmas was totally out of control. Or was it? As out of control as it might appear from our perspective, I, I think that you would agree with me that that first Christmas was actually the most in control, planned, forethought Christmas celebration that this world has ever known. And for some of you planners that think you're like super organized, I don't think that you prophesied hundreds of years before exactly what gift was going to come from what country to this baby. I don't think you prophesied some of these things that were going to take place. What we want to look at this morning in Luke chapter 1 and Luke chapter 2, I want you to see why prophecy matters. I want you to see that Jesus' birth was prophesied, and most of us probably have heard that. Maybe not to the extent that some of you are here this morning. This might be brand new to some of you. Most of us have heard that the, the birth of Jesus, this coming Messiah, was foretold. But why does that matter today? Okay, I get it. That was... That was 2,000 years ago. But does it really matter today? Absolutely it matters. Absolutely it matters. Look with me in Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 26, read 26 through 33, and then we'll jump over to chapter 2. It says, In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at these words, you think? I mean, do you ever just read that and go, of course she was greatly troubled. She was greatly troubled at these words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, you have found favor with God. You will be with child 
and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Over in chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, it says, In those days Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census would be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was the governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea in Bethlehem, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and lineage or line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to, marry, to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. In these few verses, there are several prophecies of uh, being fulfilled that God had foretold, that God had, had told his people generations before. In fact, they were prophecies that God had known even before this world was even created. That God deliberately intended to send his son in this very manner. So that man and woman, boy and girl, might have the opportunity to live in right relationship with a living God. It's really just amazing when we consider how God foretold this, how the people heard about it and thought about it and how they had considered it for generations and then all of a sudden when it's coming you go no that really can't be true no that's not really what's happening this morning I want you to see why the the foretelling why the prophecy being fulfilled of the Christ child matters first this morning the coming of the Christ child was a fulfillment of of prophecy as we've already said here uh, we see in chapter one prophesied by the angel Gabriel, you give birth to a son, and you were to give him the name Jesus. But this in no way was the first time that the birth and the, the coming of the Christ child uh, was foretold. But I want you to see that God didn't just make this up and say, Hey, Gabriel, go, go down there and find this lady Mary and then tell her all this stuff. But everything that Gabriel told Mary was a fulfillment of, of what God had told his people hundreds of years before. There's some people that say, there are a hundred plus prophecies in the Old Testament to the coming of the Messiah. I'm not any Old Testament or New Testament expert uh, for that matter, and so I can't tell you exactly how many there are because scholars, some biblical scholars will, will uh, differ on how they count these and what they consider to be a, a prophecy of the coming of Jesus. But uh, at least uh, many would say a hundred prophecies of the coming Messiah, a hundred things fulfilled by Jesus coming and by Jesus coming in the manner in which he did. And then if you take all of Jesus' earthly life from his birth to his ministry, his crucifixion, death, burial, and resurrection, there are some 300 plus prophecies, over 300 prophecies in Scripture of who Jesus was to be and what Jesus would accomplish. Just consider that for me. On the screen uh, coming before you, just a list of a few of them. We find here within this passage that first Jesus was to be born of a virgin. That's fulfillment of uh, Isaiah chapter 7, 14. Uh, he was to be born in Bethlehem, Micah chapter 5, verse 2. It's actually uh, also in Matthew chapter 2, verse 6. Scripture says, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Out of Micah 5, 2. You see that Jesus was to be a descendant of Abraham from Genesis 12, Genesis 18. He was to be a descendant of Judah. He was to be the son of God, Psalm chapter 2, verse 7. He was to be given gifts by kings, Psalm chapter 72. Uh, he was, later we see where Herod uh, was so afraid and, and hated the thought of a Messiah coming up to, in his mind to overthrow him 
uh, that Jesus, this baby, this innocent Christ child, was hated without cause. It's fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 49, Psalm chapter 69. We also see it over in John uh, chapter 15. Mathematically, and, and you know this about me because I've told you, I try to give you a heads up as much as I can, I'm no math whiz. In fact, I was reading this week about some of the, the odds. And by the way, I'm a Baptist preacher, I'm not a gambler. So this whole odds thing is kind of confusing to me. But I was reading this week about the odds of Jesus fulfilling prophecy. Or you might say the odds of anyone fulfilling prophecy in this manner. <clears throat> in Josh McDowell's book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, classic apologetics book, a classic resource. If, if you don't have a copy of that or if you know someone who's a skeptic about who Jesus is and what he did, buy them a copy and buy yourself a copy of Josh McDowell's book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. You might also pick up a copy of Lee Strobel's book, The Case for Christ. Any of Josh McDowell's books, any of Lee Strobel's books, you ought to hang on to them or you ought to buy them, give them as Christmas presents to people especially who are kind of skeptical of uh, who Jesus is and, and what Jesus' claims are. But in evidence that demands a verdict, Josh McDowell says this. He says, mathematicians put it this way. One person fulfilling eight prophecies. I just listed seven here. One person fulfilling eight prophecies would be, one. the odds of that would be one in tenth, one in ten to the seventeenth power. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> one in ten to the seventeenth power. That is, if you spell it all out. Actually, it wouldn't be spelling. Is it spelling? If you're using numbers, it's you write it all out. I don't know what you math people call this stuff. But it'd be one in a hundred trillion. Now, that got my attention. I don't have a trillion of anything, but one in a hundred trillion. The odds of one person fulfilling 48 prophecies are one chance in 10 to the 157th power. I don't even know what you call that. I get lost after trillions. That's a lot of zeros, 157 of them. One person fulfilling 300 prophecies? You do the math. No, don't bother. His name's Jesus. I, I'll tell you what, what, a, what a crazy, what crazy odds those are. I mean, it really kind of makes winning the lottery look like a piece of cake. But think about this, and this is in evidence that demands a verdict. One person fulfilling all of these prophecies over the course of history, uh, one in 10 to the 17th power, or one in 100 trillion, would look like this. If you had 100 trillion silver dollars, now my guess is some of you don't even know what a silver dollar is. <laughs> some of you never seen a silver dollar. It's a little bit larger than a, a quarter, and you don't have them because people collect them. A hundred trillion silver dollars were laid covering the state of Texas. Two feet deep. Okay, it just got real. Oh, one hundred trillion covering the state? That's no big deal, is it? One silver dollar, a hundred trillion of them, covering the state of Texas, two feet deep. That's, that's this deep. all over the whole state. And let's say if you had to go and pick out one marked silver dollar that was put out there, just randomly go pick that one, that's still not as great as the odds are. Here's what McDowell said in his book. If a blind man is told, whoa, 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 let me back up a minute. Th those two feet deep, 
of silver dollars all over the state of Texas? Well, let's say you walk through there with a tiller and you, you, you till them all up and you just stir them up. And just, there's just all piled over there. One of them, before you stirred it all up, was marked one silver dollar. And you take a blind man and say, go pick up, you have one shot. It's not like you got the rest of your life to find it. You got one shot to go out there and touch one silver dollar, pick it up, and that would be the marked coin. Those are the odds of one person fulfilling, one person in history fulfilling these just eight prophecies. How many prophecies did I tell you that we can find in Scripture about Jesus' birth? Most people with a little Bible knowledge can find a couple of dozen. Scholars find, let's say, a hundred. And that, that description, those silver dollars over the state of Texas, two feet deep, all stirred up, blind man reaching out, picking it, that's one in eight. Those are just fulfilling eight prophecies. That's the Jesus that God sent to this earth. That just blows me away. Yet, sometimes we doubt him. Many people don't want to believe him. Some will even deny him. But he's always true to who he is. Jesus is the fulfillment of God's design, of God's prophecy. There's also a purpose in Jesus' coming. That's the second thing to share with you. The coming that Christ child was purposeful in God's plan. Just as parents are expecting a child or have a child, and they have all these, all these dreams uh, for the child, and, and sometimes some of them are fulfilled, and rarely would you say that all of the dreams for our children are, are fulfilled, or whatever we thought we knew, we didn't really know, and life changes, and you change your plans. God doesn't change his plans like that. For Jesus, his plans were fulfilled from eternity past. It's not like some events happen, and God said, oh wait, I gotta, re I gotta rework this deal. That was just a rough draft. Now I'm coming with another. You know, I'm got to change. I got to edit. That was a previous early edit. I got to change this. No, it wasn't like that with God. God's purposes in sending his son Jesus were fulfilled for the purposes we find in John chapter 1 uh, that we read. One of those is he will be called great. He will be great. Say, well, oh, that's great. What's the big deal with that? The, the origin of that word is, is the word similar from which we get our word mega. You know, we have mega everything these days. You got mega this, mega that. Uh, mega means uh, surpassing or uh, excellent, superior. That which is of a grand scale. Jesus will be superior was God's purpose. Second one, he will be called Son of the Most High. He will be the Son of the Most High. John chapter 3, verse 16 is a familiar verse for us. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his what? His only begotten Son, his one and only Son, so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The third purpose given in John 1 there says that he will be given the throne of his father David. The throne of his father David, Joseph, uh, his earthly father, was a descendant of King David, the house and the line of David. That's why they had to go to Bethlehem to register. The fourth purpose we find there, his kingdom shall have no end. From everlasting to everlasting, he is God. From everlasting to everlasting, he is God. See, Jesus didn't turn out to just be a good kid that fulfilled some of the dreams of his, par his father. No, Jesus is the eternal fulfillment of God's sovereign plan. And if at any point we deny that or try to overlook that and forget that, we have lost sight of who this is. 
Jesus is not another teacher. Jesus is not another philosopher. Jesus is not another option. Jesus is not one of the choices you can give your kids, and when they grow up, they can pick whatever religious faith they want. Hogwash. Jesus is the Son of the living God, the eternal Father. He is the fulfillment of God's eternal plan on this earth. And don't ever lose sight of those hundred trillion silver dollars mixed up two feet deep all over the state of Texas. Blind man picks the one up. It is that impossible for anyone else to be the fulfillment of everything Scripture says of who Jesus is and the manner in which Jesus would come. Why does that matter? Does it matter? Does it matter today? I mean, this, okay, so that was true, but what difference does it make today? What difference does that make tomorrow? The coming of the Christ child fulfillment of prophecy has present application for us. Here's why it matters. I can say these quickly. First, the fulfillment of prophecy concerning Jesus' birth will strengthen our belief in God's word. It, it ought to strengthen your belief in this right here. When we see how God fulfilled his purposes in sending Jesus, it should make us want to spend time with this. It should make us realize that this word is living and active and absolutely true. If it's not true, let's say these prophecies aren't true. Let's say only part of the Bible is true. Which part do you choose to believe is true? Do you know that prophecies uh, uh, comprise 25% of Scripture? Prophetic writings to, to Israel, prophetic writings to the church, of Jesus coming and so forth, make up 25% of the Bible. Say, so, well, I don't believe that part, I'm going to tear that part out. Only part of the Bible is true. Which part? Which part's true? You're going to choose to believe the, the historic, historical sections about proof of Israel's history and what, what we learn through that? Are you going to choose to believe the prophetic sections? Or are you going to choose to believe the miracles? Or are you going to choose to believe the, the narrative portions about, about men such as uh, Moses and Joseph and King David and Jesus. And here's, here's the catch that either believe it all or not at all. Say, so, well, that's a pretty hard line of you. Uh huh. Either believe it all or not at all. Friend, if you're not believing all of it, you're wasting your time. Either believe it all or not at all. We don't have the opportunity. We don't have the right. We don't have the privilege to say, well, I believe this is true about Jesus, but that whole, that whole creation stuff that we just spent, y'all spent talking at church there back in October, I don't believe all that stuff. Either believe it all or not at all. As many have said through the years, Jesus is either liar, lunatic, or Lord. Either believe it all or not at all. Secondly, Trusting in the prophecies of Jesus' birth inspires our witness. It inspires our witness. It not only informs us about Scripture and gives us a, a greater belief and, and reliability in God's Word, but the fulfillment of prophecy, it inspires our witness because this week, how hard would it be for you to tell a story about a hundred trillion silver dollars scattered over the state of Texas two feet deep? Then the blind man out there picks them up. You can tell that story can't you? When Jesus fulfilled prophecy, because Jesus has fulfilled prophecy, that, that encourages us, that inspires us. That's a story we want to share with someone. Uh, my son, uh, Janet, our son, had he, he won opportunity to go to this concert uh, this past weekend. It was in New York City at Madison Square Garden, and he saved up money to buy tickets for this concert, and he had the opportunity to do it. And I'm telling you, uh, he sent us pictures all through the weekend. He's told stories about this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened. You know, when you do something that you're excited about, you, you tell stories about it. You want people to know. Well, when Jesus, our Savior, 
has fulfilled prophecy, when Jesus is the fulfillment of prophecy, Jesus is the living God. There's no one on earth that even began. There's no possible way to even compare Jesus to anyone else. That's a story we want to share with other people. So don't miss talking about Jesus this Christmas. Don't miss the opportunity to tell your children or tell your grandchildren or your family or your, or your work party or whoever you're with. Don't miss the opportunity to say, you know, this Christmas, it's about this man Jesus. Did you know that he's the fulfillment of some 300 prophecies in Scripture? And they're not just some National Enquirer future prediction. No, it, they're historically proven factual truths. Historically proven factual truths that, that are real about who Jesus is. That ought to change our conversation. That gives us some, not just something, not just some random fact, that gives us someone to talk about. The last thing I want you to get is this, that faith in the past enables us to have faith in the future. Faith in the past enables us to have faith in the future. If that stuff happened back there, if these truths back in the Old Testament, if all those things came about, does that mean that God's prophecies that are not yet have not yet come to fruition, that they're going to also? Because this same God that was faithful to his word in the coming of Jesus, this same God has said that he will send Jesus again. That Jesus, the one who came in Bethlehem, he's coming again. This same word, this same God who is faithful to his word said this same Jesus that's coming again will judge the living and the dead. This same Jesus that fulfilled prophecy in his birth in Bethlehem, this same Jesus is, is coming again, and he's righteous. And sin cannot ever stand before him. That's why he came the first time. That's why he came the first time was to die on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin. So that through trusting in Him, faith in Him, forgiveness that's offered by Him, we might one day be able to stand and really kneel and fall on our face and worship and adore the living Savior who now is in the presence of our eternal Father for all eternity. I hear people say from time to time, and I understand what they're saying. I don't want to, I don't want to diminish this at all. But some people say, upon the loss of a loved one, they say, "Oh, they've gone to be with, with so and so," and they mention a family member, they mention a, a long time a spouse, and and I believe those things are true. But you know what? When we get to heaven, I don't think we're focused on that spouse. I don't think I'm focused on my son. I don't think I'm focused on my grandparents or buddies I've lost through the years. I think I'm focused on Jesus. Because heaven is about a living Savior who is the fulfillment of every word spoken in the Word of God. Faith in the past ought to give us faith in the future. And when that happens, when that happens, we realize He's the same yesterday and today and forever. We realize that uh, when our life looks like it's out of control, that God has a purpose in it. We realize that when this world just makes no sense at all, we understand that there's a living God who is sovereign over all of it, who has a plan for his creation, and his plan is redemption, his plan is forgiveness, his plan is victory. The response, though, is required on our behalf. God just didn't do it and it become automatic. He makes it available to us. But we must respond to him by acknowledging that he is true. He is who he says he is. By acknowledging that we believe his word is true. By acknowledging that we believe this same Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin. And just like you saw Becca get baptized at the beginning of the service... 
That same Jesus died on the cross so that all of our sins could be washed away. But Daniel, good job, Daniel. You didn't leave her underwater, did you? You brought her back up out of the water. You know what? We baptize somebody, they go to the water. We don't leave them under. They, they come up, which is a reminder that we are saved to live a new life. It's forgiven people. And that we're given eternal life through Jesus Christ. Would you bow your heads with me for a moment?